So I have a confession to make. I never ever think that I'm good enough. Um, and this feeling has pursued me from the first day. This is me nervous in the back at Mugaris when they received two stars. Don't speak Spanish, no idea what's going on, barely know how to sharpen my knife. Um, I was told by Andoni that if I couldn't understand the importance of folding the kitchen cloth the right way, then I probably shouldn't be in fine dining. Since that day, um, everything just became like a constant battle with oneself every night, thinking, what could I have done better for service? Um, you know, these, these questions just keep nagging you, but also pushing you forward. Um, this is my, uh, my, my master and teacher, Mr. Bo Beck. Uh, I started with him. Woo! <laughs> I started with him as an apprentice, uh, definitely not thinking I was good enough to come back to Denmark and actually have a, a, a student career here. Um, it all worked out for the best. And then suddenly, uh, opening up Geist, I continued with him to follow on that team. And then just thinking, okay, I've never worked in a big restaurant like this before. Is it possible to change from a little small fine dining, going into a big place like this, serving 300 people a night, just poof, pushing it out? Um, and this was, besides being confused for being his wife every time we traveled together, because I'm a female chef, uh, this was obviously the biggest challenge so far. Um, so just, you know, carefully trying to, to blend in and assimilate. Then I met this guy, Mr. Klaus Meyer, um, one of the craziest people I know, amazing person. Um, and he invited me for an interview about this project he had thought of in Bolivia, to use a model where you would take a traditional NGO work and throw it in the garbage and then do some hands-on work um, and actually not just go in, make a project, which is a horrible name, and then get out again, but actually try to see if we could leave something behind and let something grow uh, organically afterwards. So I come to his house, he's wearing boxer shorts, he just came from a tennis match, it's all crazy, uh, the dogs are running around. The interview was cooking a small meal for his family. Um, and he liked it, he liked the point of acidity, which is very important for Nordic chefs, as you might know. Um, and then he asked, um, so 30 people, no education, do you think you can manage that? Uh, can we build a culinary school in Bolivia? And my mind is going, of course I can't. And you're like, yeah, sure, yeah, I'll take it on. You know, what can you, know, what can you do? Um, this is anticucho, anticuchera, uh, one of the typical, my favorite uh, Bolivian dish. But this is kind of what we're competing with. So going to a country, you risk like, getting in trouble with the whole cultural thing of what is this blonde lady doing over here and are we not good enough? And, and then at the same time, this is an amazing but one dollar dish, so suddenly you're like, yeah, fine dining, okay, let's, let's do this. Um, this is uh, one of the first teams of Gusto, uh, 30 people standing in front of you, waiting for you to change their life and be like, okay, so hit me. And I didn't think that bread doesn't rise at 4,000 meters of altitude, you're like, Oh, so the recipe needs to be modified. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, having some Amazonic fish in. Um, this is Kenzu with the bones of a paiche. Me standing in front of, a set of all these people and being like, okay, so this is how you do this. I practiced a lot when they weren't looking. There was a lot of baking going on at night. Um, finally, we cracked the code together. And as much as I was able to teach them, of course, I probably learned 10 times as much on a personal level. Um, so this is six months in, uh, Food and Wine magazine comes out with an article that freaked us out. It's a positive thing, but are we the new best restaurant in the world? I'm like, Jesus Christ, stop looking at us, you know? It's, you know, just let us be over here in the corner. We'll cook some nice Bolivian food and yeah, just get on with our lives. Um, this is, of course, a big push for the team, and it's a super positive thing, but it's just one of those things that every time something happens that is good, then you're like, oh my God, there's somebody coming, you know? Um, 
we had we all, we received the Civic Medal of Honor, which is a big thing. Uh, this is the first time it's been given to non-Bolivians. Uh, this is a Medal of Honor for pushing forward culture and for improving the country. Uh, so this was a big thing, and obviously we had no idea what it meant, but the whole local team were freaking out, and they're like, oh my god, this is amazing. This is given to presidents, it's given to a lot of people. So this is again where, at least for me, thank you so much, but damn, more responsibility, you know? Um, this is Manka. Uh, at one point, we grew out of Gusto. There were so many interested in having a, a, a piece of paper saying that they had graduated uh, in Kitchen because it's a, I think it's a good way to move on uh, with your career and do other stuff, and it's a career that opens a lot of doors, uh, even to a little street food stall or whatever. So these are the third generation of almost 7,000 graduated by now in 14 schools, but then again, uh, you see their happy faces, and then at the same time, you're like, did I even teach them the right things? Is this enough? Is this, what are we doing here? And, you know, but it's, I mean, the things that you receive and the things you give, you know, it's, 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 it's a gift, but it also comes with a lot of responsibility. This is Noemi and her mother on her graduation day. This is one of those moments where I started realizing that I'm representing a completely different culture, a country that isn't mine. Um, and you suddenly start hearing the parents go, my daughter should have a lady's education. She shouldn't be a cook. And I'm like, then what am I, you know? And this turned out to be a very social thing. Um, homemakers, maybe babysitters, um, maybe a couple of other professions, but definitely this was not for, for women. I've never been in a situation where I had to deal with that. Luckily, I know many have, but this became kind of a thing for me to say, okay, we need to also fight that fight. So now we're talking equality, we're talking opportunities, but now we're also talking female forward. Uh, there's a lot of things suddenly that you have to put you know, under your umbrella and, and help uh, some of these young people push, push forward. Um, one day, I get a call from William Drew at 50 Best saying, you are Latin America's best female chef 2016. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> all these fierce taco-mating ladies out in the world, the grandmothers of Bolivia, all the street food stalls, all these thousands of years of tradition going through their hands, and then, you know, of course, again, what a great honor. But it just felt so humbling and I think every time that you receive something, I just not lowered my head in a negative way, but you just become more and more aware that you have a lot of responsibility of giving back. Um, so this, of course, uh, was a, an amazing thing for all our female team, because they see it as a, if you can do it, then I can do it, chef. And it's like, yes, you can, go, go get it, you know? So this is, again, you know, if you can't control it all, at least damage control. Um, so, the last couple of years, I've been able to travel a lot, represent uh, Gusto abroad, and, and also now just myself, actually. Um, and ended up in Pakistan, of all places, uh, doing a dinner for 600 people, uh, traditional Danish food. It was a very, very, very strange experience. Um, this was my team on the first day. This is clearly the first time they've had a lady in the kitchen. Um, it could have created chaos. It was a little bit chaotic in the beginning. A lot of men being like, no, I'm in charge, no, I'm in charge, no, I'm in charge. And I'm like, no, I'm in charge. <laughs> and then... <laughs> Thank you. And then all these doubts just come back, you know? Are we actually serving these people tonight or are we gonna bullshit around, you know? And this, you know, we had a lovely time, smiles, we made it, we served 600 people. We have a thing here called Kolskol, and if you've been to Denmark, you will know what it is. It's like a dessert milky thing. We did that in Pakistan, and everybody, ah, I love this lassi. I'm like, yeah, whatever you want to call it, you know? Um, so, I've been to Bahrain, 
the Middle East has a lot of female chef students, so that's amazing. Uh, but then again, you're like, am I overstepping? Am I saying something culture inappropriate? Why are you wearing a scarf? You know, all these things that suddenly you're like, can I even say this to people? Um, but I think also we have to just be open and honest. So that's the way forward. This is the male chefs of Russia. Clearly, there's a lot of guys there. Um, so this is another approach. You speak to them differently. But the results are pretty much the same. All this diversity kind of confirms that you know absolutely something, but absolutely nothing. So when you travel around, you're like, yeah, I'm this great chef. And then you find out like the omelette. I'm like, I want to learn how to do that. And I want to do that. And I want to do that. And you feel empowered but useless. Um, this is my, uh, <laughs> this is Denmark. This is my new uh, working area. Food organization of Denmark uh, is doing a traveling project where we go around. Um, mostly now we've been on the west coast of Denmark. This is what we call French fry heaven. This is all that coast is beautiful, beautiful, be beautiful restaurants filled with French fries and frozen fish. And I mean, we have quite a bit of sea so we should be able to cook real food. Um, one of the most inspiring thing is to go into a kitchen with a chef or a kitchen helper that's been there for 15, 20 years, and then grate a little bit of lemon zest on a couple of fresh shrimp and just see their mind like, wow, this is delicious. I'm like, yes, I know it is, then let's do that instead of that. And instead of being annoyed by it, which I would have thought they would have been, but honestly, they're like, in the beginning, like, hmm. And then suddenly, they're on board. And what if we add peas to that? And what about spring onions? Should I get some? No, no, no. And they're like, yes, that is the spirit. If we can just, you know, with a little microplane, a little bit of lemon, just incentivate people from cooking for 20 years to go back in the kitchen and just get excited about it again, that is worth all the money. This is the place in winter. It's really, honestly, happening in summer. Not so much right now. Um, on the other side, I have a c lot of jobs, so don't be confused, I am too. Somaliland is one of them, uh, a project called Fair Fishing, where we go into Somaliland, and there's been done a lot of work with the, the hardware part, so getting them ice and ice machines and all the logistic part, and now we're getting into the whole cooking part. So you see yellowfin tuna, bluefin tuna, treated really bad, um, because it's not, I mean, if you're not able to keep uh, fish fresh, then it can be the best fish in the world, but after a couple of days, it's really disgusting. Um, so now we're trying to clean their mind from the whole yield with fish, and then not deep frying it, but actually working on developing dishes uh, with fish that are nutritious, use the whole fish, do a stock, do this, scrape the bones, like the whole thing. And uh, this is the second day where we had the, the, the homemakers. They were super excited, a lot of selfies going on. But also just seeing these ladies makes you understand that it's not everything you hear on the news, which has for me been very confirming, uh, being able to travel this much. But at the same time, you're like, what if I tell them something completely crazy and they go out and spread the word out in the world and then suddenly it all comes back to me. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry about that, you know. Um, but for now, it all turned out for the best. Uh, this is the first time in my life I filleted tuna. I accepted the challenge and I was like, yeah, sure, that sounds amazing. I want to go there, I'll do this and we'll fillet some fish and we'll teach them this. And then on the flight there, I'm like, I never filleted tuna. And I'm like, shit, this is going to get out of hand. This is going to be completely, you know, I'm going to be useless in front of these people. I found out they freeze the whole tuna and they, like, chop pieces off with a hammer now for filleting. So it turns out my skills were fine. Um, <laughs> but, but you never know. Um, I have been asked a lot lately, lately am I opening a restaurant? Um, and I don't know. I think it's the same insecurity, the same fear, the same whole thing, coming back and being like, am I good enough? Have you been to Copenhagen? Do you know the amount of amazing restaurants? Do, do we need one more? You know? 
so maybe it will happen. No, but um, but but that's the point. Like it's it's if I can do these things and travel around, and I don't want to call them projects, but you know, helping out with different projects and 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 try and pitch in with the with the little weird knowledge that I have from different places, then maybe that's more important than than having you know a set four walls. I don't know. I'm wondering. I hope you will help me salute this. For now, I'm very Copenhagen hipster. I enjoy being back. Uh, so, uh, so, so for now, we're just we're just chilling out. Um, I found this um, this uh, motto a couple of days ago, and I think it's really suiting for how I feel as a person. Um, I don't think we should be pursuing perfection all the time. I think we should just like fucking you know do the best we can and then try and push things forward. Um, so thank you for listening and have a great math. <laughs>